Oi, oi, it's your boy, Grateful Jack Slack. And we're witnessing the dawning of a new age. I know many of you who have excellent taste in mixed martial arts have struggled while an obviously mid-fighter like Valentina Shevchenko is showered with praise as perhaps one of the greatest fighters who ever lived, while a fighter of great quality like Linton Vassell languishes on Bellator undercards. Last week, Valentina fell, and as the Wheel of Fortune goes in medieval literature, but also in uh, American daytime TV shows, as the Wheel of Fortune goes round, what is on top will go down below, and what is below will come up above. And Linton Vassell scored one of the best wins of his career, probably the best win of his career, uh, the other night at Bellator, smashing Valentin Moldavsky. Uh, he, he batted him so hard that people on Reddit immediately pivoted from Moldavsky being Fedor's protege to actually he's just a lawyer who started MMA two years ago. <laughs> and you're like, that's obviously not true. Why are you just lying? Um, but yes, it seems like after years of having to podcast about the wrong people winning and the wrong people losing, we're finally getting a turnaround. And I don't want to, I don't want to do the smugness too much. But Piotr Jan also suffered a devastating defeat. <laughs> and his fanboys are out in force. So we had a Bellator, we had a UFC, we had a K1, which I still haven't watched all of, but I will uh, give my strong thoughts on it, because I am the world's foremost J-Kick expert. <laughs> Those fellas do not like the Valentina-style riffs nearly as much as MMA people do. But yeah, good stuff all round. Um, let's start with... Let's start with the UFC. So, Pyodian versus Mirab Dvalishvili. Oh, I should have opened with the Dvalishvili of touching your willy. That was everyone's favourite back in the day. But Mirab Dvalishvili coming off a win over Jose Aldo that no one wanted to see. Um, not only was it kind of dull, but also uh, it was Jose Aldo was basically in position to challenge for the title again. And it could have been his like last fight fighting for the title. And instead, the UFC booked him at, alt- uh, at elevation against a cardio machine, he won one round and then he just got leaned on for two rounds. So everyone who even liked Morab was sort of mad at Morab about how things turned out. But he gets this fight with Piotr Jan. Piotr Jan, obviously one of the best bantamweights in the world. There was, you know, even with all the laughing at Piotr Jan fans, because they are inherently hilarious, they love telling you how he's going to murder a fighter any way he chooses before the fight, and then explain to you the finer points of the scoring and why he actually should have won after he loses the fight. But uh, all of that aside, he is, skill-wise, has always been one of the very best fighters in the world. You know, he could be, um, well, I suppose he can't now because he's been beaten by a number of people in his own division, but he was pound for pound. I'd put him up there skill-wise all round, one of the best fighters in the world. And the last two wins, there were always, uh, you know, there was a way that you could argue Maybe maybe even if he lost, he could have done things differently and won. You know, it was a close enough fight that decisions made in the fight made the difference or would have made the difference. This fight, he was utterly blown out of the water and it was remarkable to watch. I hope to God that uh, Mirab Dalashvili is on huge amounts of EPO because otherwise this doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> uh, to, to shoot 40 takedowns or 44 takedowns in a fight and throw over 200 strikes, and connect over 100. Well, how many did he throw and how many did he connect? Hold on. We're pulling up fight metric, even though it's unreliable. Even though the nerd who write, who does it blocked me. Um, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, he landed 150 strikes. That's mad. Um, more than Piotr Jan even threw. That's significant strikes, sorry. 202 total strikes, whatever the fuck they are. And uh, fight metric has him down as 49 takedowns, not 44. But this sort of crystallizes a word that I'm not sure is appropriate there, but I'm going to use it anyway. This sort of brings down to its essence the discussion we've been having for the last couple of weeks. We were talking about it before John Jones versus Cyril Garn, and we were talking about how John Jones's takedown percentage had gone down. But I was saying I don't know whether takedown percentage is that good as as an indication or even watching a fight and watching someone fail takedowns. Because the thing about good fighters is that they mix things up and they use misdirection um, which runs counter to the idea of once you're shooting you should be trying to finish it at all costs and every every time you duck towards a guy's hips that should be a good faith effort now I don't think they count things like when um, Chad Mendes level changes and comes up with an uppercut or if you just slap someone's leg and throw an overhand 
Um, but they do count like when you uh, push someone's shoulder and pick up the leg, which is not necessarily a sincere attempt at a takedown. Even a shot is not necessarily a sincere attempt at a takedown. We were talking about this specifically with John Jones because he shot to get the clinch against Gustafsson in their second fight. Now, do I think that Murab Dvalishvili was trying hell for leather to get Piotr Jan off his feet on all of those takedown attempts? No, I don't. Um, they were largely, you know, I don't think he's going to say no to a takedown if, if he hits Piotr Jan's hips and Jan's completely out of position and Jan just falls over or he picks up Jan's leg and Jan just trips over himself. He's never going to say no to those, but he's not going hell for leather trying to finish it. So while, of course, that is a defended takedown for Jan and that's a failed takedown for Murad Dvalishvili, does it really matter? I think people treat takedowns as if, like, if a takedown doesn't succeed, it's because the guy attempting it ran into unexpected levels of resistance and he was really trying to finish it. And another guy who's good at this is Ricky Simone. I mean, I always say when Valashvili's fighting, go watch the Ricky Simone fight because it is, it's overshadowed by the weird ending, which is really cool and you should watch for its, you know, on its own. But it's a really good fight back and forth between the two of them. Not every level change has to be a committed attempt to take someone down. A level change is, you know, if you time a good level change in a boxing exchange, the takedown comes easily. But if you level change and get the guy throwing his hips back, you can come up and hit him. You can uh, break from, you can take the clinch, you can break from the clinch and hit him with an elbow. There's tons of stuff more complicated than just level changing onto someone's hips or picking up a single. Great example of that is uh, Matt Brown when he was fighting Robbie Lawler, having a horrible time getting uh, close to Robbie Lawler without getting countered. Posted on the shoulder, picked up the single leg, Frankie Edgar style, held it for a second just to push Lawler back and then dropped it in through a right hand and landed one of his best blows of the fight. Or if you pick up a single leg and you run someone to the fence and then you drop it and come up into an upper body clinch. Did you fail that takedown? No, you used it for a purpose. And that's a move you see pretty commonly, to be honest. So a lot of uh, Murab Dvalashvili's takedown attempts in this fight, the purpose was to keep Jan on the back foot. And this was uh, combined with his striking and, you know, just to create a pressure and move Jan backwards the entire time was sort of the successful execution of the prototype laid out by uh, Aljamain Sterling in their first fight, uh, where he backed Jan up with lots and lots of volume in his striking and lots and lots of failed takedown attempts, but he wilted in the end, whereas Murab didn't, you know, even seem to be breathing that hard. It was uh, crazy. Uh, and his striking was a good deal more threatening too. Had some really weird people say that they, he didn't even land any significant strikes. <laughs> he was landing one-twos constantly. He was hammering Jan with the calf kick when they were in closed guard. Jan switched to open guard. Uh, Jan went to southpaw, so they were in an open guard position, which meant the strategy um, threw up the right head kick constantly. Um, I think the story of this fight was, one of the reasons that I enjoyed it so much was that Jan was making good reads and adjustments, but they were momentary. He, he would take a little while to make a read and, do something, the the read would pay off momentarily, and then it wouldn't matter because he'd just get overwhelmed again anyway. It was really very impressive. So in the first round, he was obviously aware that Morav's plan was going to be to back him up because that's Morav's plan against everyone. But pretty early on, he decided that he was going to um, shoot his own takedown. The the Yarn special, which is where he slips his head to the... He's orthodox versus orthodox, slips his head to the left, steps through with his right foot, and uh, hits a double leg basically the wrong way. And he's done it to loads of people. But uh, he went for it, almost got uh, Murab off his feet, failed, and then uh, didn't go to it again the whole fight. But it was a nice little read that he was going to try and break the pressure with. But instead, he tried this big takedown attempt, a big committed takedown attempt with the intention of getting Murab off his feet. And then he was back to defending and, and absorbing strikes and uh, takedown attempts the entire time. He got hammered with the low kick and uh, really looked to be suffering from that. So he switched to southpaw. Uh, he noticed Murab was throwing high kicks. And Murab, I think it was the second round or the third round, he threw four in a row. <laughs> and on the third, Jan went, OK, I'm countering this next time. And then looked surprised that it was coming up a fourth time. But he countered by taking it on his arm and throwing his own kick underneath. The cut kick, which we're always talking about, is an awesome technique in MMA. If you can make the read and get the cut kick, it is... I don't know if it counts as a takedown because the the stats here say that Jan only has one takedown in this fight, but he did cut kick out, cut kick out his standing leg and controlled him from top for a little while. Um, 
the fight I always use is Sadiq Yusuf versus Andre Fili. Fili was throwing up high kicks. Yusuf came out at the start of the second round, kicked out the standing leg, stayed on top of him for about three minutes. And that wins you the round. You know, there's a, a cut kick in Muay Thai is you look silly. The other guy does a like, oi, pose, and you get up and you get back to fighting. A cut kick in MMA is you're on the bottom because you had the audacity to throw a head kick against a guy who saw it coming. There was another mi- nice moment in maybe two or three again, but um, Jan went southpaw, landed a beautiful left uppercut to the body and a right hook to the head. The left up, sorry, the uppercut to the body generally, rear-handed or lead-handed um, from either stance. Great way, solar plexus uppercut, great way to slow a guy down, but it just, it was, um, you know, pissing into the wind. It didn't, he did it once and then he never went back to it because he was constantly defending himself. And then you saw the Jan classic backstepping swings, um, it put this in the Filthy Casuals Guide to Piotr uh, Jan, which I think is still up on the YouTube channel. But he loves st- uh, coming out of clinches or, or exchanges, stepping back and doing a big swing over the top with his head down. The, the Igor Volchanchin style disengaging punches. And he hurts a lot of people with those. And he kept doing them to uh, Dvalishvili and Dvalishvili didn't seem to care. Because typically Jan does that. He breaks off a, a punching exchange or a clinch with a big swing and the other guy goes, ooh, better watch my P's and Q's now, got to be a bit more careful. And Mar- Marab didn't do that. He just jumped back in and Jan couldn't keep throwing these big backstepping swings. So all in all, tremendous performance from Marab. I didn't think Jan looked bad even. I think he just looked like, it looked like uh, chess where the other guy gets four goes for every go you get. It was just incredibly unfair. Marab's actions per minute were off the chart. Someone asked me, how do you get uh, cardio like that? And I thought, well, if your dad's a pharmacist who's been to jail, that's always a good uh, a good start. Brackets, satire, not serious. Um, so the rest of this card, endless fatties on this card. Don't know why. Loads of light heavyweights and heavyweights. All of them bad. Um, Romanov came out, having tried last time and cut the weight and come in in shape. And everyone went, damn, he's in great shape. And then he looked like shit anyway. He decided to come in this time just looking like shit as well. And... Um, this guy who's been unstoppable picking up people like Chase Sherman, Jared Vandera, uh, well, not Juan Espino, because that was, we're always talking about Juan Espino, slapped the shit out of him. But, uh, you know, he'd been t- picking up giant dudes and slamming them. Uh, the moment he meets someone who's a little bit more than just a giant dude, the moment he meets someone competent, he shoots a takedown and just folds onto his front. I think he had like two takedown attempts in this fight, but just desperate. Volkov, not a famous wrestler. You'll remember Volkov getting manhandled by um, Curtis Blades. Even Tom Aspinall was able to uh, get him off his feet pretty quickly. But Romanov, who's supposed to be the specialist, turns out he's just not good at anything else. That's it. But uh, no, good on Volkov. He looked good. And I thought his last performance against Rosenstruck looked really good too. Um, He is a glacially slow man. But when you're that tall, you've got that much range and warning on people coming in on you. And they don't even want to try and strike. uh, It's a lot easier. Other light heavyweight and heavyweight stuff. And like, um, the, the Krilov versus Span one. Oh my God. I saw this being reported as like an awesome triangle. When in fact, Nikita Krilov jumps on his back. You know, you, if you read the play-by-play, someone pointed out this out to me on Twitter, but they read the play-by-play and it's like Nikita Krilov jumps on his back, falls over the top, snatches a triangle on the way down. You're thinking of um, Nicky Ryan. You know, if you go watch a B-team highlight reel or a Nicky Ryan's video about triangles, there's a load of highlights of him going to get on people's back, putting in one hook and then deliberately falling back the other way and attacking the triangle instead. No, what happened was Nikita Krilov tried to jump on Span's back, fell off, and then Span ran towards him from halfway across the ring, ran towards the supine Krilov and jumped headfirst into a triangle with no no effort from Krilov. It's not like even Fedor Verdum was pretty sloppy, but Verdum did some work in that instance. This was just terrible from Span. And it combined with, I'm don't, not even know, sure, who was it, Petrino? One of these bums in the 205 divisions earlier in the, in the uh, night ran up to his opponent on the ground. His opponent didn't even try and upkick him. It just sort of happened because Petrino ran onto it. Just dreadful. I was really bummed out by the loss of Ricardo Ramos on this card. Really fun guy, boxes into back takes, does lots of spinning back elbows, uh, has a really nice inside trip. Just great fun all round. But unfortunately came in eight pounds heavy, which yeah, is sort of really stretching the limits of professionalism there. And his opponent quite rightly didn't agree to fight him. 
The Loki bangers we were talking about, um, Jonathan Martinez versus Said Nurmagomedov. Fantastic fight. Really good back and forth stuff. Like we said, Jonathan Martinez, technically brilliant. Really solid fundamentals. Um, not always pushing the finish. And uh, not a great finisher, generally. But the, the Cub Swanson win really helped him with that. It's kind of like the Giga Chikadze thing. You could try forever to get him a win over lower competition, but if you give him an old guy, man, he'll get the finish. Didn't get the finish here, but was looking much better in the later going than Said Nurmagomedov was. Uh, the low kicks... Nurmagomedov was basically turning his back every time he got kicked in the leg. Watch this one with the missus. She was like, damn, that dude's got big legs. And I went, yeah, that's, that's like his whole game. <laughs> he just throws his big legs at other people's legs. But he did well fighting off takedown attempts. He did well on the ground when he got taken down, um, not looking like a disaster. He's played guard well, actually, um, which seems to be... I don't want to say playing guard well is a good answer to Dagestan, but we have always said, like, sitting up against the fence is giving them what they want for the most part. And the Magomedov didn't look bad by any means. Um, it was a good competitive fight. Another good competitive fight on this card was Victor Henry versus Tony Gravely. Gravely? Gravely? Um, I put up a clip of this on Twitter with some annotation. Just a little example of why I love Victor Henry. In this combination, he double jabs in, throws the, uh, the right hand, catches Gravely around the, the side of his guard, throws a right uppercut, throws a right elbow over the guard while angling out to his right, grabs the collar tie because he's elbowed over the guard, steps out to a deeper angle, hits a knee, Steps back southpaw, slips a punch, comes back in, throws a front snap kick to uh, end the exchange. Just beautiful. The man, there's dudes being like, oh, if he had any power, he'd be good. But, you know, he's hitting people hard enough and he's extending these um, exchanges to a point that's just exhausting for opponents. This is a sport where still at the highest levels, people run in to throw their haymaker and they run backwards after they've thrown it. And he's another one on this card with amazing conditioning because... There's sort of like this thing going on with him and Josh Barnett where Josh Barnett is com constantly shouting, keep moving, Vic, do this, Vic, do that, Vic. Um, and Victor Henry has to do it. <laughs> and like there's moments where Victor Henry looks like he wants to take a break and Josh Barnett keeps shouting at him. Like he, he gets um, taken down very briefly in the third round. And Josh Barnett's like, he's looking for a break, Vic. Get up, Vic. Break his hands, Vic. And, you know, there's a brief moment where he waits on the floor and he's right back to work. His gas tank is insane. But I think this one uh, sort of underlines the trickiness of Rafael Asuncao, because Asuncao was uh, Henry's last opponent. It was a disappointing and sort of unexpected loss after that impressive performance against Hany Barcelos. But against Barcelos, Victor Henry threw, 108, threw 352 strikes over three rounds, landed 180. In this one, he threw 244 strikes over three rounds, landed 150. This is significant, by the way. I don't, I don't look at total. Um... While defending 14 of 17 takedowns. But in the Asuncao fight, he lands 55 strikes. I mean, he threw a whole lot more, but like, that's just the magic of Asuncao. He really lowers people's output, even massive output freaks like uh, Victor Henry. But Henry got the uh, split decision over Gravely. I think, yeah, well deserved. Um, Rafael Asuncao was on this card also, fighting Davy Grant. And he was looking good. He was doing his, his stuff. He was. Uh, Getting the odd takedown. David Grant was fighting very strange, as he always does. <laughs> Someone said on Reddit, um, I love the way that he won't throw anything that's not a hook, <laughs> even if it would benefit him. But in this one, he actually was using the, the jab and the double jab, and he won two'd. And um, if you watch the the bit where he hurts the Sun in the third round, it is from a little one-two, um, sort of fake-ass punches, you know, just pumping him out there to get a Sun moving back. And then he bangs him with a big swing. Grant's always had a really good read on people, like the, the spinning back fist that dropped to Sun here. Really well timed. He waited until the sunset was like, I'm okay, thumbs up, and then spinning back fisted him. But even then, the first two rounds was a sunset circling around the cage and making it hard for Davy Grant to do much. I pulled up fight metric again. Uh, sorry, apologies. But uh, a sunset was working at a 72% connection rate. That's crazy. But a sunset was having success with the wrestling, getting Davy Grant down. Davy Grant's always been a, a good, fun grappler. But um, the controversy in this one was that Davy Grant was on one knee along the fence. Asuncao pulled it out and David Grant held the fence and pulled uh, just long enough to get his knee back under him. And it was bad and they took a point for it. Keith Peterson did. But in the course of taking the point, he said, because I've taken the point, I'm taking the position away, which I think probably if you're a Asuncao at the time, you probably would prefer the point, but he was ahead already. 
So he might have just preferred to have the takedown, but then where do you start them from with the takedown? Because he didn't actually hit the mat at any point. It's another one of those things where there's never going to be a perfect way to do this. Um, and even if you if you think, you, even, if, even if you change this rule so that you could take the point and have them land in bottom position, there's going to be instances where it doesn't really make sense. Because that's the thing with rules. Like, they, you know, case by case, it does change. But it was unfortunate because after that, Davy Grant got to work, hurt Asun Seo, dropped him. Asun Seo dived on his hips and Davy Grant uh, locked in a upside down triangle, a Sankaku, uh, the judo style one, grabbed around the waist with his hands and squeezed like his life depended on it. And he got the submission. Really sad because Asun Seo was looking good for the second time in two fights after a real slump. And I say that as someone who absolutely loves Davy Grant. Some um, dude who everyone was talking about because he has a record of domestic abuse got submitted by guillotine choke. But it was a middleweight fight, so it doesn't matter. Um, and then, yeah, that's about it. I had interesting from that card. Oh, I'm sorry, Mario Batista versus Guido Canetti was good too. Um, Mario Batista using the same sort of passing we talked about last time, you know, throwing the uh, top arm over the head from half guard, scooping the, the leg in half guard so that even if you get pulled over the top, you can attack the leg. Actually, Victor Henry's leg attacks in the third round were really nice in this one. Ended up in backside saddle, and I thought he was going to finish it, but uh, Gravely worked well and got out of it. But yes, the two things my wife enjoyed while I was watching these fights were Jonathan Martinez's gams and uh, the Mario Batista suplex on Guido Canetti. Really nicely done. Got the, the neck soon afterwards. I like Batista. It's, he's another interesting one where he, be, he came into the UFC uh, with a fight against Corey Sanhagen and got murked. And that was when, you know, we didn't know how good Corey Sanhagen was. Sanhagen went on to great things. And aside from the loss to Trevin Jones back in 2021, Mario Batista has beaten like six dudes in the UFC now. Finished four of them. Looked good. Looked really good. So then the Bellator card was the kickoff of the Bellator Lightweight Grand Prix. The boycast was focused on this uh, this week because it is pretty special, this, this Lightweight Grand Prix. Um, headliner is man Nurmagomedov versus Benson Henderson. Nurmagomedov, obviously tons of hype behind him. But who have you beaten, mate? You know, it's uh, going five rounds with Patricky Pitbull where neither of you do much damage. Doesn't impress me. But uh, Benson Henderson is obviously long in the tooth, old, old guy. Um, but always been a very survivable guy and a really scrambly grappler. Got head kicked seconds into this, spent the most of the first round with Usman on his back and then got choked. Um, you know, impressive finish from Usman. Benson retired at the end of it. Probably a good time to shout out Benson Henderson because... While he, you know, he's been very, more more misses than hits in recent years. But there was a time, you know, in WEC he was amazing. Had a pair of fights with Donald Cerrone, beat him twice when Donald Cerrone was really at the top of his game. Uh, had that amazing first fight with Anthony Pettis as the last fight in WEC. Lost the WEC title in the process to Pettis. Um, but it was a really good back and forth fight. It was overshadowed by the Showtime kick, which has been repeated ad infinitum. But the whole fight was really good. And uh, then he came to the UFC, beat Mark Bokek, Jim Miller, Clay Guida for a title shot. All those guys, very, very good. Fought Frankie for the title, beat him. Close competitive fight, and we were. this was the era of immediate rematches. So Frankie got a rematch. Benson won by split decision this time. Beat Nate Diaz in what was like, even then people were like, why is Nate Diaz getting a title shot ever? Uh, and then Gilbert Melendez uh, in a split decision before losing to Anthony Pettis, but three defences of the UFC lightweight crown, which I believe is tied with the record. Because defending the belt even once in this division is incredible. It's the deepest, well, except for maybe bantamweight, it's the deepest division, always has been. And, you know, just to give you an example of how topsy-turvy things are, to even get to the title, you've got to be looking unbeatable. And then you could be like Anthony Pettis, in the course of taking this belt from Benson Henderson, beats Jeremy Stevens, Joe Lozon, Donald Cerrone, submits De Benson Henderson in the first round by armbar. Everyone goes, oh my God, how's this guy ever going to lose? Fights Gilbert Melendez, beats the shit out of him in an easy fight. Gets the Wheaty Box cover. Everyone goes, okay, I can't see this guy losing for a long time. Ra uh, Rafael Dos Andres comes in, beats the snot out of him. He loses to Eddie Alvarez, Edson Barboza back to back. It's just brutal, this division. So any number of title defenses is, is incredible. It was always Benson's thing to have really close competitive fights with whoever. Like, it's kind of like I said about Gar uh, sorry, Gamrot the other day. He can have a competitive fight with Prime Habib or a broomstick. Like He's just he's never going to decisively beat someone, but he's never going to decisively lose either for the most part. Um, and yeah, that was, that was Benson in a nutshell. But I think, you know, I think probably should be a Hall of Famer in the UFC. Um, 
just for the three title defenses at uh, lightweight, that's incredible. And you know, if you're doing like a who's who of WEC, it's crazy that WEC was only forty eight events. You know, <laughs> like BKFC has done more, the murder company. But if you're doing a, a look back at WEC, it's him, Pettis, Cerrone, Varna, Roller, maybe. Just a bunch of studs all guillotine each other the same way. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks to Benson Anderson for an awesome career. Well done to Usman Megamedov for getting a big name scalp uh, and moving on in the tournament. Um, but then, then Michael Page knocked out Goti Amuchi with a two leg kicks. Um, Goti Amuchi, I thought, was riding a, a hype train that wasn't matching his actual ability. But man, didn't see him going down this easy. Um, rough, you know, got got probably injured in the process you don't go down to two low kicks unless something's gone wrong and then of course the fight you're all here for linton vassal versus valentin moldavsky i love linton vassal not just because he's a meme but i genuinely i don't know if i've got this across in my meme like love of him and just talking about him for laughs a lot ground and pound in mma not a lot of great guys out there it's more like a skill that everyone has. Linton Vassell, 10 out of 10 ground and pounder. He's 10 out of 10 ground and pounder, 11 out of 10 ground and pounder with 3 out of 10 in everything else. <laughs> his striking is dreadful. His takedowns aren't great. Um, his takedowns tend to be he grabs a single and goes down to his knees in the turtle and he'll hold on to the head outside single and then gently, gradually pull you down to your hip. So you go from on all fours to just on your hip uh, into the crack down. And it's such a out of place takedown for someone this gigantic and monstrous looking, you would think, oh, he's going to do upper body takedowns from the clinch more ever. Nope. He's going to fall down your leg like Sakuraba, cling to the bottom of it, and then eventually convert it to a takedown when you get carried away, hammer fisting his head. But in this one, he got put on his back by Moldavsky a couple of times, which was really bad for him in the first fight, but got up. Uh, first one was a, sorry, second one was double underhooks half guard. I think he got the double underhooks from closed guard and then he, pummeled his legs to half guard and started sitting up on a classic get up slash sweep. Um, very messy, but he got up pretty easily. And uh, the first one was a beautiful Ricardo Lama style, get the fuck up cross hook elevator sweep. Where you got the butterfly hook in and on one, uh, uh, you got one butterfly hook in the wrong side and you just lift the guy over you. You know, you make him cartwheel and he got up off it. It was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, he's a massive man. He's probably very strong and probably, Leg presses quite a lot. But uh, yeah, he just threw him into a cartwheel and got up. Lovely stuff. Been saying it for a while, but that Riccardi Lama's sort of system uh, of, of putting in the reverse knee shield or the far side, the cross butterfly hook, whatever you want to call it, uh, is, is very smooth. And I think it has tremendous value in MMA, particularly because like the worst thing that can happen from it is that maybe you give up your back and turn to the turtle and start getting up. Best thing that can happen is that you guillotine Charles Oliveira as you sweep him over the top of you. But then something crazy happened in this fight. They came together and Linton Vassell, the slowest, sloppiest striker in the division, threw a nice right straight and a good left hook behind it, knocked Moldavsky on his face, got on top and started battering him. And Linton Vassell's ground and pound, and not just ground and pound, like his top game once he's passed the, the closed guard, his half guard and pinning game and how he strikes off it is incredible. Um, the elbows he landed in this one, Moldavsky was obviously already reeling, but the ref let him beat Moldavsky's mouthpiece out. And the sound of these elbows that he was bringing down from way above him, brutal, brutal stuff. If you, if this is the first time you've seen it in Vassal, if this is the first time you've heard me mention it on the podcast, you haven't been listening enough. But if you aren't familiar with his game, go and watch his fight with Liam McGeary, who's a really good guard player in the light heavyweight division. He just holds him down, b beats him up from half guard and north, south and mount. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's threatening these Americanas from mount, finally gets his arm triangle, finishes it by placing the leg inside the half guard and turning his man away, as Gilbert Burns did the other day. Something that Neil Melanson probably taught him because he was training with Melanson for a long time um, and is now catching on in a, in a larger way. Not the traditional BJJ finish, but uh, Gilbert Burns is doing it and he's a world champion BJJ, so... He knows what's up. Or Vassal's fights with, you know, Sergei Haritanov, put him on his back, beat the shit out of him. Ronnie Marks, beat the shit out of him. Tim Johnson, you know, that was that was the big Fedor win. Oh, he knocked out Tim Johnson, who's still quite good. And then uh, Vassal just battered him in one round. 
So Vass was on a five-fight winning streak. Four people finished from the top since going up to heavyweight. Only loss was his first fight against uh, was his first fight at heavyweight against Moldavsky, who went on to fight for the title against Bader. So yeah, give this man the title fight against Ryan Bader. I want to see it. He did lose to Bader back in um, 2017 in a light heavyweight fight. But where Bader is a light heavyweight fighting a heavyweight, Linton Vassell is a, a concrete cow. He's the Milton Keynes concrete cow. Fucking gigantic dude. And then the other thing on this weekend was K1, which I'm still finishing watching, but the uh, fight between Yuki Yoza and Tayo Asahisa was fantastic as expected. Two karate boys had a great fight the first time around. Yuki Yoza is popularizing the front kick to the rear quad, and it's gorgeous. Uh, I put one up on Twitter. I put a compilation of them in one fight up on Twitter. It's incredible. Um, Hiromi Wajima beat uh, Jom Tong, whose name I can never say, but this was after Masaki Noriri had basically a, a showcase match, and I joked that it was super midweight, made of J-Kick people very upset. I'm sorry, J-Kick people. He, it was good, it just wasn't Noiri. Um, Noiri's fight was, you know, I'm always saying watch Masaki Noiri because he's got, he's got like 50 fights now. I was very lucky to be in an arena in Tokyo, basically on his breakthrough fight or his breakthrough tournament when he uh, turned up at Glory 8. He'd done some stuff in Crush, but Crush wasn't big in like 2012, 2011. But he's just gone on to be Mr. Knockouts. He's phenomenal. He's got every every weapon you can have, basically. He's got this one. He dropped the guy with a left hook just by bullying him to the ropes, waiting for the guy to throw back and timing the left hook. He did this in the... Uh, last K1 Grand Prix he competed in too just crowded the guy until the guy opened up and Noiri beat him to the hook he just said I'm going to throw the left hook as soon as this guy's guard opens sort of uh, assertive counter punching and then after dropping the guy he, he closed in on him through a combination stepped back and then stepped forward again with a right straight dropped him on his ass. brutal I mean Askarov's just you know he's 37 he's been doing this a very long time but you know sometimes you just want to see Noiri Merka dude and then the main event was Tatsuya Yamato versus Kenta Hayashi, which was great fun just because Yamato fought this in the dumbest way possible. He did it off the ropes. He was like Jersey Joe Walcott without the shoulder rolling. <laughs> he was just taking punches and then throwing back bigger punches. And he won the fight. Uh, you know, I said he won't remember his children's faces, but he's, he's won my respect. He's a boy. And then stuff further down the card, you know, Kyotaro beat Ishii, which was just tragic. But we'll talk about that on the boy cast because there was like 24 fights on this card. Got loads of questions to answer, but I'm not going to do them today because I'm running low on time. I will answer some questions on the boycast. This week's boycast is going to be a banger because we've got a really good fight. We've got, oh, we've got fights going on in my backyard. England. <laughs> That's about as much as it is in my backyard. But we've got um, Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman 3. The rematch of an incredible fight last year. Not last year. This year. Fuck. Yeah, no, last year. At any rate, Leon Edwards fought him off in the clinch and uh, mounted him in the first round. Faded through the second and third and the fourth and then knocked him out in the fifth. Incredible fight, incredible turnaround. I think a lot of people are still seeing Leon Edwards as a much worse fighter, which I think is probably unfair. But I'm going to have lots to say about that fight on uh, the boycast. You've got Gaethje versus Fiziv, which they've been working on forever. Gunnar Nelson's coming back because it's a London card. They're like, yeah, Gunnar, come on in. He's fighting Brian Barberena, which should be fun. I, I mean, imagine that's a winnable fight for uh, Gunnar Nelson. Um, Jennifer Meyer versus Casey O'Neill, the one we've all been waiting for. Uh, Marvin Vittori versus Roman Delizzi, love it. Jack Shaw versus Mark Wanamakani, if you can get through that first round. <laughs> uh, I'm going to hit all these jokes on the boycast about Amakani's shit conditioning and how he hasn't actually improved it in 10 years. Um, Makayev's fighting, some guy from Brazil who won a fight on the Contender Series. Lerone Murphy's back, not against um, Nathaniel Wood, which was an exciting one. But unfortunately, uh, Wood got injured. Also means just no Nathaniel Wood on this card, sadly. What the fuck is Joanne Wood doing on this card? She retired. And Jai Herbert's on the card. Jake Hadley. Disco Tudorovic. I quite like him. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. So if you want to get in on all that, support the podcast, be a boy, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fireprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Vascular Linton Vassal Bless.